Kathy. All right. So on the phone lines now is our sister Kathy Howell, who is the daughter of uh, Leonard Percival Howell, also known as a gang, or Gigi Mirage, one of the founders, known as the first Rasta, the founder, founding father of uh, the Rastafari movement. Good morning to you. Good morning to you, my sister. You know, um, we have had many discussions, uh, Kathy, both of us, about your dad. Uh, and, and I remember when we spoke the last time on air, we talked about, you know, that, that time when we went in search of, uh, of your dad, of Leonard Howell, uh, as part of a wider In Search of series, along with the National Heritage Trust, which was then shared by Professor Vereen Shepherd. And what 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 um uh, what a search what 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 an informative I mean it, it, there's so much that we learned um, during that process about Leonard Howell uh, that's quite a while I think that was 2007 or 2006 yeah. 2007 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah so much came out there that I I felt at the time that such an injustice was done to the memory. And we really must honor our obligations to remember, you know, to the memory of Leonard Howell, that he wasn't even uh, spoken about or, or, or acknowledged in the way that he should have been within the Rastafari community at the time. 2007 we are talking about, which is quite interesting. Now we see things have changed a bit. But tell us about your dad. I mean, who was Leonard Howell in terms of him being just a man? Talk to us about his early days. Okay, first let me say, I have to give kudos to you for doing that program because you have enlightened a lot of people by doing this program in Jamaica that was actually, they were sleeping so you wake them up. So I know that you will leave a benchmark, you know, on the sands of time, sister. So let me say thank you. And also to sister, uh, Vereen Shepherd, she's listening this morning. Uh, let me say this. I see my, my father, I would look at Leonard Howell as the man who announced the coming of El Selassie. Just like how John the Baptist announced the coming of Jesus. And my father, who was a, a a man that say what he means, he means what he says, he didn't clinch, and he was an intelligent person. I look at him as if he was more like a messiah. And I shouldn't say this to a lot of Christians, but I'm going to say this right now. As we look back in ancient times, you know, how they nailed Jesus to the cross for teaching about the Almighty God of Israel, the Redeemer of the world. Yet the people continue to clutch to their religious, who suffered so much atrocity for sounding the trumpet of a black king, who was crowned king of king, lord of lord, and conquering line of the tribe of Judah, and who opened the eyes of black people when he thought about black history here in Jamaica, most of which were so despondent. Right now, you know, you're talking about being depressed of all the atrocity that happened to them. So, you know, how we'll develop a movement against colonial culture, sister. And yes. I can say this, that for this... But we'll talk a little bit. Let us, let's, let's talk a little bit about his, um, his early life. Because he... Where was he born? Which parish? My father was born in the parish of Clarendon mm -hmm. in an area called Redland. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get Redland and Red Hills kind of mixed up because mm -hmm. they're so close. Right. And he was the oldest of, you know, many children that his mm -hmm. mother had. Mm -hmm. And he, the parents that wanted my, my father to have a better life, encourage him to migrate to the U.S., which he did mm -hmm. in the early 20s. Mm -hmm. And my father had been a very astute person, even at, this, at a young age. And, um, you know, during the process of all the atrocities and discrimination, segregation that was going on mm -hmm. with the colonizers, 
you know, of course, he knew that he had to do something. So I look at him that he was appointed and anointed mm-hmm. to do a work that a lot of us would never have done. Mm-hmm. And so that he, he traveled widely and, and returned to Jamaica, as you said. But it, it was when he came back to Jamaica that he started um, speak, talking about the emperor, uh, about the emperor Haile Selassie, well, about the, the crowning of the emperor Haile Selassie and pointing um, to the emperor, as you noted before, as the messiah uh, returned to, to earth. But how was, he, how was he treated for this? <laughs> that's, the, that's a very good question. As you and I know, during colonialism, black people were very much on the bondage here in Jamaica back there in the 30s. In the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, well, they say they give us independence in the 60s, but all they give you was a national anthem and a flag because they didn't, the British people still does not believe that Jamaicans are capable to govern themselves, so they put them put in place a uh, governor general mm-hmm. that still act on the advice of the queen. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine what was going on there. Yes, and the 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 fact that my father came and started a new paradigm in Jamaica, mm-hmm. it was against colonial isms. Mm-hmm. It was against colonial uh, 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 behavior. Mm-hmm. For you know you to come and say Thank you for listening you're to the teaching radio. your Hit people the about listening. their history, and uh, number one for the fact that my dad established the crowning of His Majesty, who was the um, the twenty. Actually, the Rasta movement gave gave concept with with El Selassie, which was the twenty fifth monarch of the Solomonic dynasty. And my dad started preaching that this is where black supremacy came in because everyone throughout the history of the world, even the king uh, family, they had to come down and bow before uh, El Selassie. So that gives a different vibes to black people to let them know that they were not they were not born to be slaves. And your dad, um, Leonard Howell, and we're talking about Leonard Howell today, as you know, today's um, Sunday, June 13. Leonard Howell's uh, birthday is, will be June 16. He was born June 16, 1898, right, my sister? Yes. And uh, he was he was actually um, tried. He was arrested and tried for, for sedition. In, yes, in, 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 for, for talking about the, 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 the things he was talking about, including um, pointing to the Messiah returned to earth. You know, my father was in prison for, oh my God, please, let's not talk about pri- the number of times. You know, that mm-hmm. was just one, but my father's been to prison so many times. Mm-hmm. You, could start, you can't even count on your Exactly. One, 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 so he was, he was actually seen as a, as a threat to the, the colonial uh, structure. To, yes, to, he was. And, and, and thought, yeah. Yes, he was. But, you know, the, one of the most admiration part of, the, you know, as a child, I, I just know him as daddy. And as one says, if you get close to a mirror, you really can't see yourself or see anything. You have to step back. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, later on in years, I really get to really respect and honor this man, not just as my father, mm-hmm. but as a hero. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can recall when my dad told me when they sent him to the jail, one of, one of the times, let's say one of the 20 times mm-hmm. or the um, mm-hmm. number of times mm-hmm. that he was sent to jail for sedation in St. Thomas, you know, they, 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 the cross-examination asked him, you know, what did he say? And my father said, I, 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 I told my, my followers to think of his imperial majesty kings of king, lord of lord, conquering line of the tribe of Judah as the Messiah and the mm-hmm. Messiah of love. Mm-hmm. And of course, they thought my dad was was what? Crazy. Mm-hmm. And whatever charges that they had on him, my father continued to say that he was innocent. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the final analysis when they sent him to prison, he turned around because he hadn't, he didn't have the, he did not have the privilege to mm-hmm. get a lawyer. Mm-hmm. He had to 
be the one that actually, <laughs> oh my God, he had to be his own lawyer. He mm -hmm. had to defend himself mm -hmm. against the heart mm -hmm. and the mob that mm -hmm. wanted to persecute him. Mm -hmm. And he turned to them, to the jury at the end of the day and says, my father says, I know I'm innocent and I was born a hero. Yes. And beyond the shadow of doubt, I will die a hero defending my race. And, and, you know, there's a lot to be said about Leonard Howell in this regard, you know, because even I know that in recent times we see academia um, now kind of catching on. They're coming from behind in the study of, of Leonard Howell and we see a few books out and so on. But, but, but it really has been such a shame that there seems to be even within academia and, and the the elite and the political um, ruling class here in Jamaica, that over the many years, this effort to suppress knowledge of Leonard Howell and who he is and who he was. And, and, and I, then I know I want to go to Pinnacle because he, uh, he didn't just talk about um, Luke, the, the Black Messiah, but he also talked about self-sufficiency. This was the foundation of, of everything that he believed in. Um, self-sufficiency and independence, uh, um, full in emancipation of black people. And so he created this space, um, a, a pinnacle. We're speaking with our sister Kathy Howell, who is a daughter of uh, Leonard Percival Howell. Leonard Howell was born June 16, 1898. He's also known as a gang. And that might sound uh, familiar to you because, yes, Bob Marley did call himself the gong and you know about Tough Gong. And that is directly from Leonard Howell being the gong. And he also called himself, well, he is also known as a gong guru, the Gigi Mirage. Um, we were just before the break, um, Sister Kathy, uh, we we'd brought up the, uh, the pinnacle as, as, as that space. Uh, that was identified, that physical space identified and created by Leonard Howell as a representation of uh, the independence and full emancipation or movement towards full liberation of uh, African people. Uh, tell us about Pinnacle, how many acres of land and what was done there, what was the plan, what Leonard Howell, what your father had in mind? Uh was pretty much the aftermath of slavery and I would consider Pinnacle of the anchor on our, our, our tradition and heritage. Pinnacle for me represents liberation, it represents equality, it represents dignity and self-empowerment and most importantly sister, Pinnacle is the birthplace of liberation of the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, you know, we're Thank still in limbo agitating for a Rasta heritage site in Pinnacle. Mm -hmm. And by the help of our ancestors, we're going to succeed by any means necessary. Now, my father bought Pinnacle back there in the, in the late 30s. And he bought Pinnacle simple with the con concept that the street meeting that he was being held all over the country and being uh, ostracized for keeping st street meetings. Even at one time, they put a price on my father's head, which, of course, they did um, eventually kill him. But let, let me say this about Pinnacle quickly. Pinnacle um, had, was the concept where we had to organize, centralize, and, and and this was an idea that came into my dad's uh, mind where we had to have a place for ourselves, a safety place for ourselves that we weren't getting beaten up by the police all the time. I heard my dad talk, talk about 200, two, two, uh, 2,000 or something like that. But eventually as a child, when I was born up there, I know we had over 600 acres of land even up until maybe the um the 70s 80s or something like that because they use some of those land for the boy scout uh but my dad wanted us to repatriate to africa because the concept was repatriation and 
in order for us to repatriate, we had to have internal repatriation, where my dad thought we had to be economically um, uh, sufficient. So everybody there had this whole concept of self-sufficiency, self-esteem, uh, self-development, uh, trying to do something in order to earn money to go back to Africa. So everyone in Pinnacle was a skilled or professional person because they had planned to go to Ethiopia under the umbrella of the EWS and unless all those people up there were skilled, and, and had some kind of ID, you know, preparing themselves to go to Ethiopia. And so, so that, and so that our, listener, our listeners understand, and for those who are hearing this for the first time, here is one man in Jamaica, along with his team now, moving out of St. Thomas, where the, the idea of Rastafari was birthed, and moving now into St. Catherine, to, to a place, a pinnacle, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of land bought and purchased by Leonard Howell as Jamaica's first self-sustaining community, meaning that those who went with him, this was an entire community that included thousands of acres of land where people were living uh, and sustaining themselves. They were planting, living off the land. They were... Um, taking care of their own, uh, making their own um, tools, making their own, uh, I suppose you had the blacksmith and the all kinds of smiths and the oh, all yes, kinds. So it was a know, proper... I mean, most of, yeah, most yes. of them, they were farmers. They were farmers. They were skilled tradesmen. So they this was a self-sufficient community. It was almost like a state within a state. This was a self-sufficient um, community because Leonard Howell understood that that was necessary for full freedom, full liberation, and even for repatriation. Um, to happen. One of the great injustices uh, in Jamaica is what has happened to the land's pinnacle belonging to the Rastafari community through Leonard Howell uh, here in Jamaica. And the extent to which successive governments in Jamaica have stood against the people, and we say this without fear or favor, have stood against the people in returning those lands to the people or, uh, or, or um, giving re reparations f to the people for those lands. So this is, this is a, 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 a very, very, it's a stain, it's a cancer, it's a stain on the conscience of Jamaica, that the lands at Pinnacle ha are going the way they're going and have gone the way they have gone. And still, and still, there is a National Council for Reparations here in Jamaica. I don't know if they're functioning now. But there's a National Council for Reparations with an arm of that council responsible for internal reparations that have not yet said anything about Pinnacle after all these years. Before the government hijacked the National Council for Reparations, let me finish my sister because I'm, I'm, I have something to say. Before the government hijacked the reparations movement in Jamaica, Pinnacle was at the center, as was Coral Gardens, of the rep internal reparations movement here in Jamaica. Now that the government has hijacked the reparations movement, Coral Gardens has has been cheated out of everything and 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 have been giving some wishy-washy um few dollars and 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 government is responsible now for rasta uh, and and pinnacle there is silence on pinnacle and in the in the name of leonard howell on this june 13th just just a few days from his birthday we demand either the return of the lands to the people because you have the documents or reparations and we also demand that you recognize Rastafari that you use in your tourism ads and so on and make Pinnacle, all of Pinnacle, a national heritage site and much more, much more than that. But we go on, you know, we, more. My sister, June 16 is coming up now. What's going to happen? Uh, are you, is there a plan in place for, the, for observing this birthday uh, Earth Day solar return celebration of uh, for Leonard Howell? Um, 
Um, I'm glad you asked that question. There is no official celebration that is going to be in Pinnacle 2001 this year due to the COVID. And there is lots of um, uh, work that to be done there on the tabernacle because it needs refurbishing. However, I can say this openly that Pinnacle is Rasta heritage site, so the door is open to our Rasta family to come and pay respect to Leonard Percival or Earth Strong because, you know, gatherings of all people, how that is right now in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is where we're at. We are going to um, refurbish the tabernacle, and I hope next year, you know, it would be in... uh, in a situation where ones and ones can come from all over the world mm-hmm. to celebrate. All right, my sister, I just want to thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for reaching out. Thank you so much for coming into this space again to talk about your father. And we hope that we can have a much longer conversation about him. Uh, You know, in in 2007, we spent months, I think it was three months, just talking about Leonard Howell in this space um, while we went in search of him. We can repeat those, some of those programs, but we want to have the, continue to have those conversations with you. And also just to talk about Pinnacle and what's happening to those lands at Pinnacle, what have happened to the lands of Pinnacle and why it is that the government isn't saying anything about it. Thank you, sister. I thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, program, sister. And I hope that the government bodies are listening because it's about time. We have to have Pinnacle Heritage Side by any means necessary. Jarasta Parai, blessings always. Good thanks, always. my sister. That is Kathy Howell, Catherine Howell, the daughter of Leonard Howell. Please, I know there are many of you who weren't around, who didn't, weren't necessarily listening at the time we went in search of Leonard Howell. Do me a favor. Start, just Google him and start right there, right? And then continue the history in the way they are supposed to teach us the history. Because if we knew our history, we would take back our land. You know, we talk about Pinnacle and every time I talk about Pinnacle in this space, I get really, really upset. And it is righteous indignation because it's an injustice that can, that perpetuates itself across Jamaica where landlessness is really the bane of our existence here in Jamaica. There is no independence without land. There is no full liberty or full freedom or full emancipation without land. And Jamaica and the people of Jamaica have been denied land you know for since before you know we are we ourselves are are, a part of the experiment of settler colonization because before us were the indigenous people the tainos whose lands the europeans took away and who were almost decimated You know, my, I say almost because we know otherwise, even through our oral um, tradition. My great grandmother, for example, Maroon Taino woman, has always maintained without being asked. And especially when she was speaking of her pride and her dignity, would stand up in places where she was, where people tried or the system tried. To discriminate against her she would say i am maroon and i am arawak so we know even through our oral traditions that they didn't we didn't all die and memory is in the blood and we are honoring our moral obligation to remember the land so that pinnacle which was the first Rastafari village and first self-sustaining community in Jamaica, or one of the first in Jamaica, belong to the people of Jamaica, and in particular to the Rastafari community. And I know that there are a lot of people living on Pinnacle now who have bought land because the land was stolen from Leonard Howell. And there is documentary evidence to prove that the land was stolen from Leonard Howell. 
and whoever owns the land now and there are lots of developments happening there and lots of people are living there so how do you get these people off their land but but even while we speak and when the fight and even while the fight has been going ongoing for the return of the lands lands that were not developed that we had developers in pinnacle developing the land even while the people were fighting for the return of the lands but there is a corruption that runs deep and full of putrid pus here in jamaica that it, it is at the heart the heart and it is it is eating out the the the, 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 the nation from the middle so it's just pus in the middle putrid pus in the middle extending outwards and everybody's wrapped up in this nastiness and the stench is on too many who even would appear beautiful or otherwise we just need to say what we are saying You know, it, it, just to speak truth, to speak truth is sometimes not the easiest thing. Most times not the easiest things to do, thing to do. It is easier to go with the flow. But this deserves some plain speaking. And for the sake of Africa, let us speak plainly. That the Rastafari community continues to be robbed here in Jamaica. And you know what is you know what is it is what is serious about how this is being done is that they have taken the activism, they have taken the thirst for liberation, they have taken the radicalness for the most part out of Rastafari by hijacking the movement creating a division within the ministry that is responsible for Rastafari affairs and silencing the people. And too many Rastafari have bought into this. So the radical activists are silenced in a lot of spaces and the fight the fight is gone out of many. Talking about radical activism. Talking about radical activism, Walter Rodney, Baba Walter Rodney, was assassinated on this day, 1980. 